Coming to you from Studio A here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, it's time for the Gardening Simplified Show with Stacy Hervella, me, Rick Weist, and our engineer and producer, Adriana Robinson. Today, let's talk tools. When push comes to shovel, you got to have good tools to, well, take care of your landscape. And I love talking about tools, Stacy. And one of the things I think about immediately when the topic of tools comes up is heirloom tools, mm -hmm. tools that have been gifted to you by a grandfather or a great grandfather. And I think of the great uh, Greek philosopher Plutarch and the ship of Theseus. Now, the thesis paradox is this. They had this ship, and they took all the planks off it. And then they put new planks on it. When you put new planks on the ship, is it still the original ship? Mm, that's a good question. A exactly. Something to ponder. And I think about that in my shed, because if I have an axe from Grandpa, but I replace the handle on the axe, is it still Grandpa's axe? Absolutely. In that case, you know, the handle's going to wear out. <laughs> the head is still good. The business end is still Grandpa's, and that's what matters. The business end. I like that, Stacy. All right, so if you go, to, uh, you go on the web and you search garden tools, usually the first three things you see are tools for weeding, tools for your comfort, like knee pads or clothing, and then uh, tools for pruning. But of course, you have to start with shovels. Got it. Because a shovel is a groundbreaking invention. <laughs> Sorry. It is. Literally and figuratively, yes, you are correct. <laughs> Don't buy cheap shovels. Put your money into a really, really good shovel. And you can get handles of composite fiberglass, steel, or wood. You can get open back shovels, closed back shovels, forged shovels. I like to sharpen my shovels. Pay attention to your shovels and uh, make sure it's quality. Well, you know, the fact is that, especially if you're young and you're just getting started out at your first home, it's very tempting to buy an inexpensive shovel and just say, this will do the job. Exactly. But the simple fact is that you will absolutely spend that same amount of money over time replacing said inexpensive shovel Uh Oh, you know, because it keeps breaking because shovels take a lot of work. They, yes. they take a they take a beating, really, and especially if you live in clay soil. I mean, living in pretty sandy soil, our shovels don't take quite as much, but you never know when you're going to hit a rock or some old concrete down there exactly. and it's going to bust it. So it's worth it, not just in shovels, but in all garden tools to really shell out and make the investment in a lifelong tool that can be an heirloom. It doesn't have to be, you know, a $500 shovel, even if you could potentially find one. Even those ones they use at, you know, fake tree plantings and groundbreakings are just spray painted gold. <laughs> um, but, you know, invest in a good tool and it will pay you back by not having to replace it every year. Oh, amen. I tell you, when push comes to shovel, I have a propensity for shortening the life of shovels. So spend some money up front, make sure it's good. You need a good spade shovel for edging. You need a stainless steel soil knife. I like soil knives because uh, otherwise you end up using your pruning shears and that's not a good idea. I have either. never, okay, I, I've got to confess, Rick, I am a little disappointed that you've been using your pruning shears in the soil. The only <laughs> time my pruning shears see the soil is if I have to cut a root. Yes. And, uh, but you know, then I'm not like jabbing at it. I'm actually using them to prune the root now, but I will say this about a soil knife. One thing that's very handy about a soil knife is it's super easy to keep in your pocket because it's flat. So a soil knife is kind of like, so when you think knife, you're not thinking like a butter knife or a kitchen knife. Um, it's like a flattened, uh, trowel exactly. with with a sharper edge on each side. So really easy to fit in your back pocket if you got one of those loops on mm -hmm. your pants, a carpenter loop, it fits in there. If you got a side pocket, it fits in there. So it's really easy to have handy and it's not always like jabbing into your pocket so you can't kneel down. Ask me how I know. Yeah, just don't sit on it. Don't, don't sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what, another tool that you have to have is you have to have good quality gloves. Now you may debate that gloves are not a tool, but for me, they're super important. And I wanted to show you uh, my favorite gloves. I, I have it on here. They're called West County Gloves. And what I love about these things is that they have Kevlar on the mm. tips. So I can be as rough as I want to be, but they're gentle, soft right here on the thumb so you can wipe ah. your brow when you're sweating. And they're made of uh, recycled spandex. I don't want to think 
of what they recycled, but they were recycled. Probably just the cutoffs. It's, it's okay. okay. <laughs> so uh, this is this is my go-to. And to prove it to you for our YouTube <laughs> viewers, these are West County gloves uh, that I took out of my car. This is just out of my car. Oh my gosh, look at that one. It shreds. This one's It destroyed. shreds. Yeah. Which brings up the point when we talk about gloves, have some leather gloves around for projects where you're moving stones or patio stones or landscape timbers. But for gardening, and these people aren't paying me, okay, but <laughs> West County gloves. A reciprocating saw for cutting ornamental grasses. Oh, we've had some always listeners, a difficult job, yeah. Yeah, who have suggested that. A good hand hatchet, safety glasses, and sunglasses to go with it. The U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission estimates more than 37,000 Americans suffer a power mower-related injury every year. Oh, that's terrifying. How horrible. And many of them were cutting the grass barefoot. Oh, gosh, no. Never, never. Not smart. I remember when I first broke into the industry, early 1980s, the fly mole was uh, very popular. It's a mower that did not have wheels but the blade would spin so fast it would it would go airborne. Oh, that sounds safe. <laughs> yeah. And here's the problem. People started trying to trim their hedges with it and what could go oh, wrong? Oh gosh. Yeah. So I never heard of that. <laughs> now, One, there's something you'll have to look for at an estate sale because I'm pretty sure they took those off the market. <laughs> they did. <laughs> Uh, according to a national, uh, the National Safety Council, there were nearly 166,294 injuries related to yard and garden equipment in 2021. Wow. That's so scary. with that, Stacy, I give you a dangerous tool, Lim Arik. This old tool is a family heirloom. It's sharp blades my hedges groom. But if I'm not cautious, I'm going to be nauseous when they take me to the emergency room. Each time you prune, you take a chance. In appendage, you could lance. Treat tools with great respect. If they're used incorrect, you're going to split your plants. Oh. <laughs> Let's be careful out there, right? Yeah, when I was in horticulture school, uh, we had a plant ID exam, and there was a difference between two very popular types of forsythia, forsythia intermedia and forsythia suspensa. And the difference between them, I mean, there's some habit differences, obviously, but is if you cut open the stem, there's one has chambered pith, so okay. the pith inside is kind of like in little rooms, and one is a solid column of pith. So I wanted to be absolutely correct. And I was in a hurry and I was balancing my clipboard and I took my pruners and I cut up the stem and I cut myself real bad Ouch. and I didn't want to tell anybody. So then I was just kind of like trying to hide my bleeding finger and finish oh. the exam. And uh, it's, you know, it's, it, in all, it's just like anything else around the house. Those injuries happen when you're not paying attention, not giving everything your full devotion. And that's really important, especially when you're using dangerous tools. It's true. You got to pay attention. I, uh, I recommend a good garden cart, a good watering can, a good wheelbarrow. Wheelbarrows don't get enough respect. They're always getting pushed around. And you need a good wheelbarrow in your landscape, a spading fork. And, uh, of course, my favorite tool is my uh, churninator where I grind up leaves in the fall. I love that. It's very handy to have. I We still need a video of that. Yes. <laughs> and speaking of videos, we are going to have some shorts on YouTube of us telling you about our favorite tools. So please do check us out on YouTube if you want to see the tools that we have amassed, heirloom or not, just our favorite tools uh, that we will be sharing in videos on YouTube. Fantastic. I love it. Head shears. Now, of course, I love a really good, solid head shears once again for cutting my ornamental grasses. I've got lots of ornamental grasses. But the point here is with head shears or shovels or pruning shears where you get a good quality bypass pruning shears. Stacy, the quality matters. The heft and the quality matters not only for how long you own the tool, but just for how it operates. It really does and you can tell the difference. And if, you know, if you're shopping for tools, don't just look at the prices and grab the cheap one and walk by. Take a moment to really hold and, you know, 
the different ones like you would be using them because you will notice there's something that happens when you have a really good high quality tool in your hands. You can just tell. And that makes especially jobs that you don't particularly enjoy in the garden a lot easier if you're using a tool that not only does the job really well, but you actually enjoy using and that you have invested the time and money into procuring and adding to your collection. That's a great point with hand trowels or hand cultivators. I always insist on uh, stainless steel, not the cheapy ones, because you'll go out there, use it one time and throw it in the trash. And, you know, some things you probably do want to have a little cheaper, like trowels, maybe if you are the kind of person like me who always has a, a big bucket of weeds and you throw your trowel in there and then a few more weeds come on top and then blammo, no more trowel. Blammo. <laughs> <laughs> been there a couple times just saying make sure you've got five gallon pails trug tubs and then finally real quickly i just want to mention an upside down sprayer if you don't know what mm -hmm. that is we're going to put the link at the website at gardening simplified on air.com but you need one of those yes absolutely coming up next plants on trial here on the gardening simplified show Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. We're talking tools today, and I, you know, I always feel like I have to. You're doing such a great job in the first segment. I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm always like, I really want to just say this one thing. So, <laughs> so then when we get to plants on trial, I feel like I need to just say that one thing. Oh, well, let's hear it. And that one thing for me is, you know, gloves. I think are the most polarizing of all garden tools. Yeah. Um, people have very strong preferences yep. about gloves, as you do, mm -hmm. as we just saw. Um, and I do as well. And for years, I did not wear, wear gloves gardening. I was a, a gloveless gardener. I like to feel the soil. I like to be down in there. And then I found myself as a horticulturist in New York City, and there was not a chance that I was going to not wear gloves digging around in the soil in New York City where, you know, who knows Whoa. what can happen. <laughs> um, and so that kind of started me on a habit of using gloves. And even when I moved back to Michigan and I said, oh, I don't have to use gloves anymore. This is great. The first day I gardened without gloves, I was like, ouch, you know, because your hands, they get, even if you're not really doing anything that you know of, they just get like these small kind of lacerations sure. on them and it's really painful. So, um, and I, to me, you know, gloves were thinking back to when I was a kid, you know, in the eighties and they had those, um, little cotton flower print gloves sure. that had the little tiny piece of elastic on the back that barely did anything. And those gloves are terrible. I mean, for me, again, gloves are very personal. You can all, if you like those gloves, that's fine, but those aren't good gardening gloves. They don't give you a lot of dexterity and gardening gloves have come so far. And they I think have. your West country gloves are a great example of that. My personal choice are the kind, um, that are elastic, like have the, the knitted elastic and are dipped in the like urethane latex. or whatever latex. Yeah. yeah. So they're reusable. I usually go through one pair a year because I end up blowing out the fingers cause I'm always digging mm -hmm. around with my, with my gloves. But I love those. They're cool. They're easy to stash in your pocket. They're pretty inexpensive. And they do everything you need. They give you the grip that you need. They have good dexterity. So I have totally come around, and now I'm a fully gloved gardener, and I wouldn't even think about doing much more than harvesting a few herbs without gloves. I agree. Speaking of fully gloved, I have a tendency of losing either the right hand or the left hand. So then I'm out there like Michael Jackson with one glove on. But still. But it's not a fashion statement. It's Just not a fashion <laughs> statement. <laughs> well, anyway, that's, that's my thoughts on gloves. And if you have thoughts on gloves, we would welcome you to leave a comment on the YouTube version because we know everybody has something that they really love. Yeah. And we love hearing about that. So uh, the topic of today, of course, is tools. And so since I do like to relate the plant on trial to the theme of the show, I have picked Aphrodite kellycanthus. What an incredible plant. It really is. Now, this is a plant that when people see it, they just love it. And a lot of the plants that we offer in the Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs line are, uh, you know, plants that people are already familiar with, that people already love and know well, and we're just trying to find improved versions of those. And to me, Aphrodite calicanthus is one of the relatively few plants in the line that's kind of a plant geek plant. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to be a plant geek to appreciate it, but it is one that plant geeks look at and say, oh, now that is a cool plant. So 
Uh, it is a calycanthus, which is also known as a sweet shrub. Um, and it's a hybrid of our North American native sweet shrub, which is Calicanthus floridus. Okay. And like so many North American native shrubs, it has acquired a massive range of common names over the years. Um, sweet shrub is the most common, but you will also hear, depending on the region you are in, sweet Betsy, sweet Bippy. Sweet Bippy. And strawberry shrub. <laughs> There I go now, doing the Ed McMahon I, thing again. I have only heard sweet. I've only read Sweet Bippy. I have not actually had a gardener come up to me and say, you know, get a load of my Sweet Bippy. But uh, you can anyway, bet my it, Sweet Bippy. <laughs> apparently, that's one of the the common names. Um, so it's a hybrid of our native one and Sinocalycanthus chinensis, which is the Asian species. And so, in many cases, there are similar plants in Asia as there are in North America. And so this is a hybrid of the two. And it fits into today's theme of tools because this is a shrub that you're going to need probably a special tool if you want to prune it. Yeah, really? This is because it is a big shrub. And a lot of shrubs that we sell in the Proven Winners line are not that big. We know people aren't looking for something that's going to overgrow their house or going to okay. you know, need a lot of pruning. It doesn't strictly require pruning. But if you do want to prune this, it's going to grow big, thick, sturdy branches that are going to need loppers. All right. So loppers is not something we talked about, but loppers is kind of like a bypass pruner, um, but much longer. So it's on a longer handle, so you can really get in there. Leverage. Leverage. And it's really good for, you know, pruning out large branches from the center of a, a big mature shrub. Um, you can even use it on trees to take out, you know, branches probably up to like an inch and a half to two inches in diameter. So it's just like a hand pruner, but it gives you a little more reach and leverage and uh, is a lot so can take out a lot bigger branches. So if you do want to prune, if you have Aphrodite calicanthus and you're going to prune it, this is a plant that I would recommend. You're going to want some loppers on. But once you have loppers, you'll find all sorts of great uses for them. They're sure. very handy. Uh, but this is a big plant. So it's a 5 to 10 feet tall and wide shrub. And you might be thinking, whoa, that's a pretty big range. Do I expect it to be 5 feet or do I expect it to be 10 feet? <laughs> and the answer to that is that the colder your climate, the more it's going to be towards that five to seven foot range. Okay. And in those warmer areas, it's going to reach every bit of that 10 feet by 10 feet. But if you have the space for this, I cannot think of few other ways to transform a spot in your yard from something that you have to mow or weed or whatever. Just plant this shrub and all of a sudden you've got like 10 square feet of yard taken up with something that's beautiful that you barely have to take care of. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and Stacy, you got me so excited about this plant by simply telling me to stick my face in there and take a whiff. <laughs> wow. Right. So I do want to, I'll get into the flowers, but I want to kind of give everybody a mental image of, of what the what the plant looks like. So if you've seen the North American sweet shrub, the flowers are similar. So they have that same kind of deep red maroon color. Okay. But the, the Asian heritage, of the, the Asian parentage, give the flowers a really large size and they're much more open. So we'll put pictures of both on the show notes at gardening simplified on air.com. So you can see our native species, just straight species like you'd find in the wilds and the Appalachian mountains. And then we'll, we'll put pictures of Aphrodite. So it's a hybrid of the two. So if you're trying to conjure up a mental image of this, I would say, imagine a magnolia or a water lily flower and now imagine it dark red. Good description. So that's pretty much what they mm -hmm. look like. Now, um, the foliage on this plant is also very, very large um, and very, very glossy. So it's a really interesting, unique plant. Definitely not like something that, you know, you usually see as you're walking around. And as you might guess, uh, because of the name Sweet Shrub, it is fragrant. Now, fragrance is one of those things that is highly subjective for people. And our native sweet shrub, and we have a version of our native sweet shrub in the Proven Winners line called Simply Sensational Calicanthus. And that thing, the, the fragrance on that will absolutely knock your socks off. It is the most delicious and unique fragrance of almost any of our shrubs, minus El Nino Chitalpa, which I've talked about. It smells like melon vanilla. Um, this Simply Sensational Calicanthus smells like... Uh, ripe strawberries, kind of. Oh, it's such an amazing smell. Now, because 
Aphrodite, the one we're talking about today, is a hybrid. Its fragrance is a little bit more elusive. Okay. So it's not necessarily one of those plants. Every single time you walk by it, you're going to go, whoa, what's that smell? Like you would with uh, Simply Sensational. But if you take a flower, especially as it's starting to fade, so it's gotten a little bit older, um, and especially later in the day, um, and you ask people what it smells like, you're probably going to get a different answer from every single person that you ask because it is a very subjective fragrance. Now, to me, the flowers on Aphrodite calicanthus smell like an apple that has fallen off the tree at, in fall on a warm, sunny day, and that ripe, that kind of overripe apple smell is just, you know, wafting up from the warmth. That's sort of what the flowers smell like to me in a good way. Great description. And I think you nailed it, Stacy, simply by saying delicious. This is a flower that smells delicious. Yes. Now, again, if you're looking for the best fragrance, you're going to definitely want to go with our North American uh, native species, Calicanthus floridus or Simply Sensational. But the flowers on Aphrodite really make up for that lack of power in the fragrance. Um, so it's not native because it is a hybrid of our, the North American native and the Asian, but again, a big plant. So give it space. But if you have space for it, I would highly recommend it. I don't have a huge yard and I grow it because I love it so much. Mm -hmm. um, so it's definitely, definitely worth growing. It does take well to pruning if you want to prune it, but you do have to bear in mind that it flowers on old and new wood. So it starts to flower for us here in Michigan, probably late spring, early summer. So you'd want to prune it after that. And then our, it does here continue to flower through the summer. It always has some flowers on it, really clear through, I'd say, August. So you get a lot of bang for your buck with this plant. It does not require pruning. But again, if you are going to prune it, you're probably going to want those loppers because this is a big, vigorous plant for coverage. Um, birds love it. It is also very deer resistant. I have not had any nibbles on mine, which is really saying something. I'm going to knock on wood, though, just to be safe. Um, hard to do USDA Zone 5, heat tolerant through USDA Zone 9, and um, really just a very, very interesting, unique plant with some incredible color. Now, that was a lot to take in. So if you're wondering what it looks like, please do check us out at GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. You can also check us out on YouTube. Adriana is going to put some fabulous footage of Aphrodite calicanthus into our show. And of course, you can always check us out on Instagram. we got to take a little break right now. When we're coming back, we're opening up the mailbag. So please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time to open up the garden mailbag. We know you've got questions, and if you haven't asked them yet, you can reach us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, or just go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, and you can click the contact form and send us a question that way. I know we're getting into the thick of it, and I know a lot mm -hmm. of people are sitting there going, I need an answer now. I can't wait till next week when Gardening Simplified is back. So you can also reach us at, just go to the Proven Winners website, provenwinners.com, there is a feedback. It says feedback questions. We're listening. You can click there and one of our horticulturists will get back to you. We try to get it within the next business day if we can. So if you have an urgent question, you can't wait a week for it to be answered. Definitely check us out there. So what do we got in the mailbag this week? Well, Stacy, a question from Lorianne. I have a question about my pine trees. They're shedding little branches. Is that something that happens every few years? I honestly don't remember that happening before. Did they drop pine cones before? Uh, did you thought you might know. Thanks, Mulch. These are the trees in my front yard. Uh, she sent some pictures, uh, ran into a neighbor walking this morning, and their trees have the same issue. Uh, her neighbor said it was from heavy snow. Uh, what in the world is going on? Otherwise, just file this in the crazy lady file. Oh, no. no absolutely no, not. No, Lorianne, you are not crazy. <laughs> no, Lorianne, the squirrels are. You yeah, are not crazy, it. but the squirrels certainly are and they're hungry and so when you get to the end of winter they'll go up there and saw off little pieces of branches leave them on the ground eat the bud and leave the debris yeah they eat the bud they'll eat the sap yep. uh, and we talked about that a little bit when we had don snow ink on a few weeks ago uh the sap is running and that includes in those uh you know pines and spruces and all of that and that bud yes yeah, so tender so full of flavor. And so they go in there, they snip off that bud, and they don't mind letting those little pieces just drop all over. And yeah, it can look like a genuine carpet if yes. they really get busy with it. Yeah. So the, the fact that this is happening, Lorianne, and it has not happened before, could just be that some squirrels moved into your neighborhood that weren't there before, or they just discovered your tree. 
Um, I also think they kind of do it just out of boredom. I think so, too. <laughs> they're chewing, they're sharpening their teeth, uh, and they hack these things off. Lorianne sent some pictures for our YouTube viewers. You're seeing those pictures right now. For those uh, listening to podcast or radio, Adriana will put them uh, at Gardening Simplified on air. Com. You bet. So nothing to worry about. The tree will be fine. The squirrels will be fine. Some of them might make it into their nests. Some of them, they're just, they're just, that's just the way it's going to be. It's, it's part of nature and the squirrels are kind of controlling the growth, whether they mean to or not. It's just one of those things, but I have seen it happen myself. It's nuts. Randy writes to us. Uh, he's He asked before about growing hydrangeas in containers a few weeks ago. I remember that. Follow-up question. I'm curious when I start putting your soil mix, mixture in the pot, when and how much of the fertilizer I should add to the pot? And I'm going to top it with mulch as you recommended. So Randy is our listener, viewer, who's putting hydrangeas in pots. Yeah, so I thought this was a really good question uh, that was probably on a lot of people's minds. And we, we've hit on it a couple times here and there on the show. But the simple fact is that when you are buying new potting mix from the garden center, you don't usually need to add any fertilizer. And the reason for that is because most potting mixes, just in terms of like their basic ingredients, the sphagnum moss, the bark, the vermiculite, perlite, all that kind of stuff, doesn't really have a lot of nutrition. Mm -hmm. So if you've ever wondered why every single potting mix seems to come from a fertilizer company, there's a reason for that. And that's because they are adding their fertilizer to it to get that nutrients in there. Now, if you are reusing a potting mix, then you're definitely going to want to fertilize. So what I usually do is I will just fill my containers, put a handful of, you know, plant tone, flower tone, something like that. You know, we like those fertilizers a lot. Put a little bit of that in, mix it into the to the top, you know, couple inches of soil. I don't personally feel like I need it all the way through the soil because if it's at the bottom, the roots aren't going to be down there. The water's going to be working on that fertilizer and it's just going to go out the bottom without ever being used. So I like to keep that fertilizer just up in the, the early root zone of the plant. Um, but yeah, so new, new soil, don't worry about fertilizing, especially for shrubs. If you're reusing old soil, then you definitely want to get some fertilizer in there and you can continue to fertilize, you know, through the season to get that growth that you need. So Randy, no cause for concern. Save that fertilizer for next year because you're going to need it then when they've been through a whole season. Dirty job. Somebody's got to do it. Our friend Jim has a great question about pruning hydrangeas. Stacy, if I had a dime for everyone who is. (laughs) I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, We have a question about hydrangea pruning. Despite watching many pruning videos, we can never quite come to grips. Very well done. (laughs) Nice. I like that. With how to deal with the whorls which emerge from the pruning point. We tend to get whorls. That's a tough word to say. Of three long flowering stems from every pruning point, and they can get long and pendulous. So we wonder how to keep the plant from opening out too much. We figure if we cut it below the whorl each year, we will be cutting the hydrangea lower and lower and lower year by year. So you get uh, you get yeah. the idea here, Stacey. Uh, uh, Jim's looking for some detailed instructions. <laughs> and I, you know, I understand because I have encountered this myself. And when your hydrangea is young, it might not matter that much. But as your hydrangeas get more mature and you're seeing more of this whorl, and what Jim means by a whorl, and if you've grown panicle hydrangeas before, you've probably seen this, usually the leaves come across, come out opposite from each other on the stem. Mm-hmm. But occasionally you will see these whorls form. And the whorl is basically that there's three three leaves around the stem. So instead of just cutting and having that forked growth, you're going to have three branches coming out of that point, And you're going to get these weird fireworks like we just talked about in our smoke bush pruning video that's on our YouTube channel. And you stand there going, what in the world just happened? That's exactly what you do. Okay. So first you ask yourself, what in the world do I do now? <laughs> and we will try to make a video on this, Jim, if we can find a good hydrangea. Probably most of the hydrangeas around here have been pruned. But if Adriana and I can find a good place to do it, we will make a video of this. So what I recommend that you do is go ahead and prune the panicle hydrangea wherever you need to do. Usually we're recommending, you know, taking off about a third of the total growth of the plant because this kind of splits the difference between taking the plant back to where thicker buds were formed earlier in the season. So you get a lot of vigorous new growth, but also
also preserving enough of the old woody framework so that you have a nice, strong, and supportive plant. So usually it's a third, it can be a half. It really depends on what you need to do. Now, if you are pruning to that whorl, go ahead and make your pruning cut as usual. And then wait and watch over the coming weeks as that new growth starts to come from the whorl. And then at that point, I would thin it to just one or two branches. Um, and I have pictures of this, uh, what uh, the owner of our trial garden has done to his, and you'll be able to see that where those hydrangeas usually would fork, what he has done is selected one branch to continue that growth. It'll be real apparent in these pictures. So please check us out at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, and I'll put those there. So what you're going to want to do is just selectively thin to one or two branches going in the direction that you want to go, because those three branches are going to be going three different directions. Mm -hmm. And so whatever way you want the plant to grow, if you want it to grow away from your house, then you would select the branch that's growing away from your house. If you want it to grow left, you'd select a branch that was on the left, thin out the other two, and then let that one branch take over. And that way you don't have to keep lowering the height of your pruning um, and you keep getting that nice, thick, vigorous growth at that point where you want it. You are a true pruning expert, Stacy. I really am. I, you know what? I'm really not a yeah, pruning expert. I, the thing is, like, I find these myself in these situations all the time where I'm pruning something, right. and That's I think, what I, mean. I think, what do I do? Right. Uh, but the the expertise comes from you know really I think taking the time to think about it sure. and think about how your actions are going to impact the plant growth and you know of, of course as we talked about in our pruning show a couple weeks ago another important part of being uh, a good expert pruner is knowing when to walk away right. knowing when to not prune and say you know what I, I don't know what to do so I'm just going to leave this for this season um, there's a lot of knowledge you you need to apply but ultimately the stakes as long as you're not taking out too much are pretty low it's like a soap opera as the world turns <laughs> i'm still trying to nail that down am i saying that right stacy yeah, whirl yeah you are oh, that's a strange word. it is a strange word but uh and it, it's a strange growth habit for the panicle yeah. hydrangeas because hydrangeas as most people know tend to be very strongly opposite yep most other types of hydrangeas that i have seen have not don't grow into these three-leafed whorls. It's really specifically panicle hydrangeas that have this unique characteristic. So, you know, I and I was asking uh, Megan, our our plant breeder here, if she knew why it happened. I was asking a bunch of people who here if they knew why it happened, and it's just just one of those things that it just does. So, Stacy, it's what I always say. There's three types of people in this world: those who make things happen, those who watch things happen. And those who wonder what in the world just happened. <laughs> yes, I think I'm in the latter. So Me too. <laughs> anyway, thank you all so much for your questions. If you have a question as well, please don't hesitate to reach out. GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. Or, of course, you can always leave a comment on the YouTube video, and we will pass that along and, and get that answered for you. So we're going to take a break. When we come back, we have a very special guest. So please stay tuned. Welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show. It's time for branching news. And today in branching news, we have the privilege of talking to Adam Mosley. Adam's uh, title is Breeding Director with Wingen LLC. It's a plant breeding company just south of Austin, Texas. And I'm looking forward to this interview because I always love talking about plant breeding here in the golden age of plant breeding. But in addition to that, I love talking about super tunias because, Stacy, they're one of my favorite plants. You know what? They are a plant that has really just ch totally upended the way people think about petunias. Absolutely. Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Adam, uh, give our listeners and viewers, first of all, an idea of what a breeding director does. Uh, give us your vantage point of the work that's being done uh, in Austin, Texas, as well as around the world in breeding these fabulous plants? Yeah, great question, Rick. So we do plant breeding. Plant breeding is one of those things that I think is, is not very consumer facing. And as a breeding director, you know, there's a lot of different um, aspects that we have to deal with. And so, you know, my job here in Austin, Texas revolves mostly around sowing out seed um, and making selections and making those selections go into what we call trials or plant trials at different uh, propagator companies that we work with. 
Um, and then helping to facilitate getting that plant from, from the breeding concept into the market. That's fantastic. Uh, and as it relates to super tunias, I, I guess the question that comes up, uh, you know, I grow super tunias. I've worked in the garden center industry. I know the value of a super tunia. As a matter of fact, I was looking at Proven Winners' website, and it basically describes it as the best petunia, period. <laughs> and I think they're right. And I'm super excited about uh, the super tunia hoopla vivid orchid coming out uh, this year. Give us an idea of the process here as you develop new varieties of super tunias. Sure, yeah. Petunias is one of those crops that's very interesting. Um, it's kind of a numbers game. You know, you've got to work with a lot of plants to find the best petunia period. And in that particular case, it refers to Supertunia visca bubblegum, which has been just, I think, a benchmark for, for all petunias on the market. Um, if consumers have grown that plant in the past, they, they know that, you know, it's more resilient to disease. It's got better flower power. It just seems to last through the season more than the, the typical, you know, um, less expensive petunias that are maybe grown from seed that you can buy at the garden center. Um, and I think that's a big distinction between the super tunias and, you know, a lot of what you can find at the, at the garden center that's grown from seed is these are vegetative petunias that are grown from a vegetative cutting or a clone of that plant. And the beauty in that is that you don't have to inbreed to get to a true to type seed. You know, we can say, all right, I'm going to combine this great petunia with this other great petunia and I'm going to make a selection from that. And it's superior now. But if I start to inbreed that plant down and say, I need it to be pink, I need it to be this size, I need it to bloom um, in, you know, March 12th in the Midwest, because that's when the retail market center wants it to be in flower for the, con for the consumer bench to come and buy it. Um, you start to lose a lot of that you know, wild species vigor and, 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 and the things that make a petunia really resilient and great for a consumer. And so, you know, we make the, our selections and we send that particular clone in to trial. That's the same exact plant that we're going to, that you're going to buy. Um, even if we reproduce it a million times or 10 million times or a hundred million times, it's the same plant. And super tunias are all vegetatively propagated, um, you know, hybrid petunia that have superior performance. And, and I think that's, you know, part of the special medicine that, that makes them so great. Yeah. And, and what that means, I think for a lot of people is that no matter when or where you buy it, say you bought super tunia one year in New York, and then you move across the country to Oregon and you want to grow super tunia again. Well, sure. There are climatic differences between that, but the plant mm -hmm. itself is the same. And so you can expect that nice, consistent performance and not have to wonder, well, Hey, this, this time it did great, and this time it didn't. And that consistency is so important in building that trust that now I think Super Tunias really has. I agree, yeah. I feel like Super Tunias have made, you know, Proven Winners has done a, a really good job of marketing to the consumer. You know, brand recognition and name recognition is something that, you know, you want to have trust. Um, if, if I'm a consumer and I'm going to the garden center and I've got a $500 budget and I want to buy, you know, a hundred plants and I want to get some soil and I want to get some fertilizer and I want to do my garden. You want to make sure that those, you know, five, six, seven dollar four inch containers that you're planting are going to give you the garden that you're expecting. You, know, you can do all these other things right. But if you don't start with good genetics, um, it's, it's hard to have a good green thumb. For sure. Now, I have a question. Several, several years ago, I was in San Antonio, Texas in spring, right about this time of year. And um, they were using petunias as, uh, I think this was even probably before super tunias were a thing. They were using su uh, petunias as a spring annual. Now, would you say that even in warmer climates like San Antonio or Austin, that um, super tunias can actually continue to be a summer annual or are they still going to be more of a spring and fall performance kind of plant? That's a really good question. You know, if you're a great gardener, I think you can do well with super tunias in most regions um, most of the summer. The thing about Texas, especially where we are here, is, is that all plants, and, and especially things like annuals, um, they need, you know, good watering, right? Mm -hmm. And I think 
outside of the heat that we get here in the summer, we just get really dry. Mm -hmm. And so it can be difficult to keep, you know, certain annuals that do like to drink um, on a consistent basis alive through the summer in climates that are drier, like we are here in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I know I did uh, a planting of them last spring in my front yard here in, in, in Austin. And I had super beanas, um, pink cashmere, and super tunia vista bubblegum. And I planted them in about February 25th, maybe, from a four inch container. And they looked, yeah, I know, right? If you're from the north, you know, it's like <laughs> exactly. planting your garden in February. But we, we have to take advantage of those cool nights in the, sure. in the spring. Um, and, you know, you hope you don't get a really hard late freeze. Um, but we planted those in, in March or at the very beginning of March, late, late February. And they lasted all the way through July, 4th of July. Um, But at that point, I got into water restriction. And Mm -hmm. I'm I'm trying to water my grass. I'm trying to water my garden. And I ended up with a $700 water bill one month. And I'm like, that's it. (laughs) I'm I'm done. (laughs) You know, I got to shut it down. So, yeah, you're in some places that have better better consistency with moisture. You know, the Carolinas, um, you know, even North Florida, you can can grow them all summer long. I mean, that's huge. That's a huge advancement. Absolutely. We're chatting with Adam Mosley. He is breeding director at WinGen LLC. It's a plant breeding company just south of Austin, Texas. Talking about super tunias, Adam, uh, I, you know, you mentioned bubblegum. I love that plant, the whole super tunia vista series. And I think that this is a, these are petunias that are ideal for hanging baskets. Uh, years ago in the garden center industry, we'd put petunias in hanging baskets and they'd get long and leggy and stretched and we're pinching and we're chopping. My experience with the Super Tunia Vista line, bubblegum or whatever it may be, is that they create this massive ball of flowers and just keep blooming. I think it's the ideal plant for a hanging basket. Yeah, I would agree. I, I, we definitely look at the Vista series. Um, as well as the mini, mini Vista series and um, and your traditional super trees as being great hanging basket plants. Um, the Vistas, I've noticed, you know, they mix really well, especially with each other. They've got this special recipe to them. Um, you know, they're they're tall. You know, in the landscape, you'll find that they'll grow to, you know, 12 to 18 inches tall off the ground, which is atypical for a normal petunia. Um, and they'll make almost these little, you know, hedges. So you think about the, the branching, the superior branching that's there and the flower power, um, combining them with other plants that maybe aren't quite as strong, you know, they tend to, we used to say in, in trials, be like, oh, it's just going to eat that. You know, it'll eat it by the end of the, the spring trial season. You, all you'll see is bubble gum. <laughs> but if you mix it with Vista Silverberry or Vista Snowdrift or Vista Fuchsia, you know, then you get this really nice combination of the three of the three colors coming out. Um, and, and that's because they're just, They've got high vigor. They've got um, great branching. Uh, they really like to fill that container, and they don't have a bulb top. They don't like to split when you get too much rain or wind or these inclement weather. Um, it'll hold its shape, and it'll continue to flower. And I think that, that to your point about the hanging baskets, you know, having something that you know is going to continue to flower and not crack all open and look weird or um, – you know, it's, it's important. It's, a, it's, a, it's what you expect when you when you spend the kind of money that you want to to get the, the plants in the garden. If you go to provenwinners.com, of course, at provenwinners.com, there are a lot of recipes for combining some of these super tunias. Like I saw one, uh, a blend of super tunia honey and super tunia royal velvet in combination. It's called hypnotic potion. Uh, boy, the variety in super tunias just continues to expand adam uh, you must be working to continue to develop more and more varieties from raspberry rush to honey picasso in purple latte a lot of interesting varieties yeah absolutely i mean we uh, we go through about oh 400 families of petunias a season which we sell at least 100 seeds of each one um, so we're looking at about 40,000 plants wow. every year. Wow. Uh, from those 40,000 plants, we pick out 400 or so to go to trial. Um, 
after we do our first internal trial here in Texas and, and uh, with our company, we end up with maybe 250 to 300 that actually go in and get trialed with proven winners. Um, from there, they pick maybe three to go to market. Wow. And so if you think about 40,000 down to three, you know, that plant's got to be pretty special. It's got to have, you know, good branching. It's got to be easy to produce. It's got to be, you know, the foliage has to stay nice and green. The flowers need to hold up against rain and storm. Um, you know, preferentially, you know, it's not like, oh, I need to be fertilized all the time to, to keep growing. Um, there's just so many different things that go into picking these plants. Um, and that trial process can take up to two or three years. The breeding process itself can take four or five years. Mm -hmm. So when you see a new plant in market and it's something like a supertunia honey or a supertunia vista bubblegum, you know, that plant has six, seven, eight years of, of growth and production trials and all the things that go into making it a supertunia before it'll ever make it to the retail market. And Stacy, um, Stacy, I think that that's important to note. I appreciate that, Adam, because for the shopper in a garden center, they may not fully understand the work that went into developing these plants. And, and like I mentioned, Adam, working with Kevin Hurd at Proven Winners or someone like yourself, working with Stacy, uh, Adriana, and the great people here at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, Stacy, there's a lot of work, research, boiling down, and the ultimate goal, they always have that goal in sight. What, how's this plant going to perform in the consumer's yard? Yeah, it's R&D. And, you know, it's so funny. I, I've often, you know, commented to other people that uh, people don't realize that it's as much research and development as goes into an iPhone or something like that. Yeah, it's the same kind exactly. of level of dedication and trialing and ideation and people just think, oh, it's a plan. It just happened. And so it's really good to hear, you know, that whole kind of story of, of what it takes to actually bring that plant to market. So, you know, I know people uh, in this R&D, they're, they're looking for the next big thing. And obviously, Supertunia Vista Bulgum has been around for a while and people love it. But I'm sure a lot of people are like me and maybe like me, they aren't a pink person or they're just wondering, hey, what's next? Can I grow another Supertunia that is this vigorous, that performs like this, that I don't need to deadhead? Um, what other colors are there? So in your experience, Experience, you know, what are some of those other varieties, whether they're newer or have been around a while, that people can expect that similar performance from, but aren't Vista bubblegum? The breeding that it takes to make a Vista requires us to use, you know, particular plants that, that have a strong dominance for a purple pink color. Mm. And so making the, the performance of a petunia do what we want it to do, to be called a vista, that name to us is, is sacred, right? We say, okay, there's only five or six of these that are truly vistas. And a lot of them, if not all of them, could be said to be within that pink spectrum. Mm -hmm. Now you have vista snowdrift, which is a white, which honestly, if you want a color that will combine with almost anything else, a white is a great color. I always used to make, like making these recipes and it would be like, oh, well, let's use Super Bean a white out or let's use Vista Snowdrift or, you know, Super Tunia Mini Vista white. And it just brings that color. It combines with most other colors um, and it gives you a really nice fresh pop of color. And I love white because at nighttime when I'm at home, you know, that's when I get to enjoy my garden. You know, something like Royal Velvet or these deeper, darker colors, they don't really pop in the mm -hmm. evening, you know, whereas the white flower really seems to stand out in my garden. So I've always been drawn to that. Um, you know, for other colors of petunias, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to breed and stay within that first or second or third generation of hybrids and get away from the pink and the white colors. Mm -hmm. Um, we have Vista Paradise, which is a, is, a, is a bright, you know, kind of electric sort of pink color um, with a little bit of sort of cherry tones in it. Um, that one is probably the most different from the, the traditional Vista colors. Um, when I look at the mini Vista series, there's uh, several in that that would give you a different color scheme, like mini Vista Violet Star is a fantastic plant. Uh, Mini Vista Indigo is an awesome, awesome plant in that sort of uh, lilac blue color. Um, 
Mini Vista Scarlet is a nice red. Mm-hmm. That's probably the, one of the best reds that has come out of onto the market. Um, Mini so- Vista Yellow is a great color. So it seems to me when we breed these plants, you know, giving you giving us the true big Vista style plant um, is that's the code that we're working on breaking. Right when we get into the Mini Vistas, and we've got okay, I can, get, I can get a little bit tighter habit. I can get a little bit smaller flower, uh, but I still get the same landscape performance. I still get the same disease resistance, um, the ability to grow in multiple climates with the same kind of performance. You know, then I get mini vista scarlet, mini vista yellow, mini vista red, um, midnight, mini vista indigo. You know, all of those ones become, that color palette becomes a m- much wider. And so those are a lot of my favorites. So the mini vistas are basically, they have everything that the vistas have, but just smaller, just like the name says. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And honestly, like in my garden, the mini vistas, I use them um, almost more than the vistas because again, it's like, you know, yeah, I I can have, I have a whole place for pink um, and white. Like I'll use vista snowdrift quite a bit, but yeah, if I want to use yellow or blue or something like that, the mini vistas are a great second option. You know, they just have a slightly smaller flower and a slightly more compact um, habit. But mm. otherwise, the bran- the branching, the color coverage, um, the vigor, you know, all of that stuff is very similar to the to the traditional vistas. That's really good to know. Yeah. I, I actually didn't know that. So I will definitely be looking at those because, you know, those of us who maybe aren't quite a pink person or doesn't go with our house color or our <laughs> container colors, you know, we want that performance with just a couple more options. I, uh, yeah, I get excited every spring to plant the Supertunia Vistas. And I wanted to mention for our listeners and our viewers and mention to you, Adam, that I love combining them with something that has a little height. So I like to, I think they're the perfect combination with a, a Toucan Cannas, uh, Truffula Pink Gomfrina, uh, Sun Credible Sunflowers, the Rockin' Salvias or the Meteor Shower Verbenas, any of those uh, really make good partners with supertunias. You have a blast of color by July and August here in the north. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. Um, you know, we used to learn in school it was that you have your thriller, your filler, and your spiller, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you know, having having these recipes that Proven Winners has developed um, in your wheelhouse and, and having those plants available at the garden center, you know, that's another big tricky part. I'd be like, Oh, well, I want to plant this recipe. You got to be able to buy them. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's why proverwinners.com is a really good resource for folks that are looking for very specific varieties. Um, but yeah, those, those plants work really well together. You know, it's the biggest thing about making a good recipe is, are they all similar watering requirements? Mm-hmm. Are they all similar fertilizer requirements? Um, is one plant going to eat another plant by halfway through the season or is it powerful enough to keep past it? Um, and you know, what do I, what do I want out of it? Do I want, uh, is it a particular color scheme that I'm looking for or is it, I'm trying to, you know, get some structure to the side of my front door. Um, or I want this hanging basket to spill and trail down the side of my, my patio or something like this. You know, those are, it's, it's anybody's it's a playground and I think they do a really good job. I used to run the R and D department at Pleasant View Gardens and uh, there's a, a woman there named Jessica Tatro and she just does a fantastic job building and designing these recipes and trialing them, you know, and I think it comes down to that at the end of the day when, when you find a recipe in the proven winners handbook or on the proven winners uh, website, you know, you can be sure that those three plants, those three plants have been grown together so many times that we know <laughs> that that's going to work, you know, and, and it's going to keep the color on it. It's going to, you know, it's going to work. Um, and I think it can be really tempting for folks to go to the, to the garden center and be like, Oh, I'm going to take this, you know, this begonia and I'm going to take this petunia and I'm going to take, um, you know, this other plant and, and plant them together. Uh, but the begonia doesn't like a ton of fertilizer and the petunia needs full sun, but the begonia needs a little bit of shade and, you know, and so you just get into this scenario where it's like, well, why did my begonia die, but my petunia looks great? Well, it's like, well, where did you put the basket, right? And so right. it's just well, a lot of 
and and that, that's why the recipes on the provenwinners.com site are so valuable. Um, Adam, as we wind up here, what are you, as, as a creator of Super Tunias, um, what are your must-know tips for someone who is maybe growing Super Tunias for the first time or wants to make sure that they are getting the most from the plants that they buy? Sure, good question. Um, Okay, so vistas and mini vistas will work fantastic in the ground or a container. A lot of the super tunias, there's a few exceptions, but most of the super tunias are going to prefer to be in a container versus being in the landscape. Um, That's kind of tip number one. Number two is bed prep. You know, get in there, get the weeds out. If you've got hard packed soil, kill it up. You got it. You got to create some air pockets, create some drainage in that soil. You know, I like to backfill here in Texas with chocolate loam, you know, so if I'm building a new bed, we'll cut all the grass out, we'll get rid of all the weeds, we'll till it up a little bit, we'll add in three or four inches of chocolate loam, we'll till that in. Bed prep is is so important for getting the plant established and, and being able to grow out. From there, as a home gardener, I don't fertilize a lot. What I do for fertilizer is I really like slow release fertilizer. I don't have the time to always mix up liquid feed at home. Now, in the greenhouse, with research, growing, producers, yes, we're going to use liquid feed pretty constantly. And if you're a home gardener and you can give it an extra shot of liquid feed every couple of weeks, it's not going to hurt it. It's only going to help it. Follow the label directions and, and go for it. But if you put out at the high rate something like, you know, Proven Winter Slow Release or any slow release fertilizer, uh, three to six month release, something like this, be generous, you know, go at the high label rate, put that down. Um, if you're like me and you don't water frequently, you know, go through and put a soaker hose in, something like that. That's what we use here in the gardens in Texas. Um, you know, just put wind a soaker hose kind of around, not not perfect, but through the bag somewhere where I want it to irrigate. And then cover it with mulch. Try and hold that moisture in around the root zone. Um you know, for us, about two, three months after we do that. So we'll do that all at end of February, beginning of March, plant the garden, and then just, you know, set it to, to irrigate for 30 minutes uh, every other day, something mm-hmm. like that, you know, and let it run, let it run, do its thing. If it rains, it rains, you know, so be it. Put the water on there um, anyway. And then around the 4th of July, we come back and we, we top dress with more slow release, Um that's that's the best way to do it in a container garden situation you know we did a lot of trials with different types of fertilizers uh when i was at pleasant view gardens in new hampshire and we found that liquid feed like if you take that grande and you plant that grande into a larger container and we would take three grandes of vista bubble gum or many of our other uh proven winners annuals put them into a five gallon container and top dress with the high rate of slow release fertilizer. We compare that to liquid feeding about 100, 150 parts per million, every watering. Um, you know, six weeks later, those plants were very comparable, very comparable. Eight weeks later, 10 weeks later, 12 weeks later, you know, you're starting to see a little bit better performance out of the, out of the liquid feed than the slow release, but it was fully acceptable. So as a general rule of thumb, I'm a, I'm a slow release fertilizer kind of person. Like I want to set it and forget it in some ways. Um, and as long as I can irrigate well, which I think is, you know, as much as you can hope for out of most gardeners is just to give it water when it's dry. <laughs> like that's, that's what you should be able to do and be successful. And if you combine proven winners, genetics, um, slow release fertilizer, decent bed prep or container prep, um, and just, you know, irrigation on, on a basis that is acceptable for you, you're going to have success. Can't beat that. I mean, that's what summer's all about is, you know, doing the work at the beginning of the season and then letting you reap all the rewards for the rest of it. So well said, uh, his name is Adam Mosley and he is breeding director with WinGen LLC, a plant breeding company just South of Austin, Texas. And we've talked about, Vista Super Tunias. I can't wait for spring to start. Adam, thanks for your time today, your enthusiasm, your work, and looking forward to spring 2024. Absolutely. Y'all have a great spring up there. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Well, that was great. I am ready to go annual shopping, although I know it's a bit too early still. I cannot wait. So we want to thank Adam Mosley for his time talking to us about Super Tunias. Thank you, Rick. 
Thank you, Adriana. And of course, thanks to all of you for listening. We hope you have a wonderful week ahead. 